My name is Flash Isaac and I'm a teacher from the future. When I was much younger, I saw thousands and thousands of people fail jam and unable to gain admission. This made me travel in time. Now I am back with a Flash Letter Jam app and a series on YouTube tagged 120 Days Jam. My mission is to help you blast jam and as well get justice for everyone who jam has served breakfast. This is episode number 37 of the 120 Days to Jam Chemistry with Flash Isaac. Before now, we've been able to look at spontaneity of chemical reactions and factors that affect spontaneity of reactions. In the previous episode, we looked at the rate of chemical reactions and the factors that affect the rate of chemical reactions. Today, we shall be looking at chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium. This is a very interesting concept. Before 1803, it was believed that all reactions are irreversible, which means if A reacts with B, we form C and D, or we form C or whatever. In any case, the reverse reaction was perceived to be impossible. In 1803, Claude Louis Bertholet discovered the reversibility of reaction. He discovered reversible reaction, which means if A reacts with B to give us C and D, there is a possibility of C reacting with D to give us A and B. What does that mean? If we have something like this, it shows reversibility of reaction, which means this reaction is in two parts, the forward reaction and the reverse reaction. For the forward, forward reaction, we have A plus B to give us C and D. In the reverse, we have C plus D to give us A plus B. This is forward and this is the reverse direction. A question comes to mind. If reactants give us products, what will make the product also to combine to give us back the reactants? One, for reaction to be reversible, it must happen in a closed system. Because a situation where two reactants combine to form a product, and one of the products is a gas, it can evaporate or it goes off. Or a situation where one reacts with the other, then it is not a closed system. Temperature and other factors can affect the reaction so that it is not reversible. Which means the first condition for reversible reaction is that it must happen in a closed system. The second condition is that the products should not crystallize. They must not form crystals. If A plus B reacts to give us liquid or gas, the liquid or gas should not be the ones that solidify. Because immediately they solidify, they cannot combine again to give us the reactant. So take note of those conditions for reversible reaction. Ammonia is formed via Haber process. So nitrogen combines with hydrogen to give us ammonia. And this reaction is reversible because ammonia can break down to give us nitrogen and hydrogen. So for the forward reaction, you will simply have N2 plus 3H2O to give us 2NH3. For the reverse reaction, or for the backward reaction, you have 2NH3 to give us N2 plus 3H2. To understand this class properly, you need to understand the previous episode and the last two episodes. In the previous episode, uh, rates of reaction, we said that for the reactants, the concentration is maximum at the beginning of the reaction. So this is a reactant. At the beginning of the reaction, concentration is maximum. As reaction begins to take place, you see that concentration of the reactant begins to go down until it remains constant. It doesn't change. For the products, 
At the beginning of the reaction, products are not formed yet, which means concentration of the product starts from zero. The more the reactant combines and gets used up, the more you have formation, formation of odor. Then we get to a point referred to as the equilibrium or chemical equilibrium. Now, what is chemical equilibrium? There are three definitions for chemical equilibrium. One, chemical equilibrium is a point where the concentration of the reactant and the product do not change. At the beginning of the reactant or the reaction, concentration of the reactant reduces, drops. Concentration of the product starts from zero and begins to go up. It gets to a point where you see here and here is constant. They are parallel to the x axis. It does not change. At this point, we say that we achieve chemical equilibrium. And chemical equilibrium can happen only in reversible reactions. Two, chemical equilibrium is a point where the rate of forward reaction is equal to the rate of backward reaction, which means the rate at which the reactants are combining to form product is the rate at which the product are also combining to form reactants. So, you see, the rate of forward reaction is the same as the rate of backward reaction. So the rate at which reactants are giving us product is also the rate at which the product are giving us the reactants. So that point is referred to as chemical equilibrium. Three, chemical equilibrium is when the number of reactant molecules converting into product and the number of product molecules converting into reactants are the same. The number of reactant molecules combining to give us products is the same as which the number of product molecules are combining to give us the reactant. Let's see the types or classification of chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium can either be static equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium. Static equilibrium occurs when the system is at rest. There is no movement between the reactant molecules and the product molecules. The rates of forward and backward reaction is constant, in fact, equals zero, which means the rate of forward reaction zero, the rate of backward reaction is zero. That is static equilibrium. Now, if static equilibrium occurs when the system is at rest, we can say that dynamic equilibrium occurs when the system is in motion, but balanced. The movement of one side is equal to the movement of the other side. Dynamic equilibrium is broken down into physical equilibrium and chemical equilibrium. Physical equilibrium involves physical changes. Example, vaporization of water. Water changes from solid to gaseous state. No new substance is formed. And, of, of course, it is a reversible reaction. That is physical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium, on the other hand, is broken down into homogeneous equilibrium and heterogeneous equilibrium. Homogeneous equilibrium, all the elements or compounds or the species involved are in the same state of matter, which means either they are all in solid state or in gaseous state, wherever. An example of homogeneous equilibrium is Hydrogen gas reacting with iodine gas to give us two hydrogen iodide gas. This is a reversible reaction. As you can see, all the species, elements and compounds involved are in the same state of matter. In this case, they are all gases. Look at another example. Nitrogen gas reacts with oxygen gas to give us nitrogen oxide gas in a reversible reaction. All the species involved are in the same state of matter. Look at this. Sulfur so oxide gas reacts with oxygen gas to give us sulfur so oxide gas. All the reactants involved and the product involved are in the same state of matter. This is with homogeneous equilibrium. Now, in heterogeneous equilibrium, all the species involved are not in the same state of matter or in the same physical state. Look at this. Carbon oxide gas reacts with carbon solid to give us carbon monoxide gas. You see that 
there is a mixture of solid and gas, not the same state of matter. Look at limestone, COCO3, that is calcium, uh, calcium carbonate, solid, uh, break down to give us quick lime, calcium oxide, solid, plus carbon four oxide, gas. They are in different states of matter. So the, why this is a heterogeneous equilibrium? This is a homogeneous equilibrium. Now let's look at the characteristics of chemical equilibrium. The characters are one, it is a dynamic process. Chemical equilibrium is a dynamic process. And the concentration of reactants and products remain the same. It is achieved only in a closed system. And at equilibrium, delta G is zero. That is, Gibbs free energy is equals zero. Then, if Gibbs free energy is zero, delta H is equals T delta S because the relationship between delta G, delta H, and delta S is that delta G is equals delta H minus T delta S. When delta G is zero, the system is at equilibrium. And in this case, delta H is equals T delta S and the system rejects certain changes. Equilibrium constant, KEQ. Equilibrium constant is simply the relationship between the forward and the backward reaction in a chemical equilibrium. KEQ is equals the constant for the forward reaction divided by the constant for the reverse reaction. If you are given a chemical reaction and asked to write the equilibrium constant, you look at it. This is a typical chemical reaction. You see element or compound A reacting with element or compound B to give us product A plus product B. In other cases, we have just one product. In some cases, one reactant breaking down to give us two products. But anyhow, it happens. If you are writing equilibrium constant, it is simply the concentration of one of the products raised to the power of the number of moles of that product times concentration of the second product raised to the power of number of moles of that product if we have two products. Everything divided by concentration of the first reactant raised to the power of the number of moles of that reactant times concentration of the second reactant raised to the power of the number of moles of that reactant if we have two reactants. No more stories. We have about one, two, three, four, five. Five questions to make you understand how to write equilibrium constants. Now, before that, take note. Catalysts do not affect equilibrium constants. It is true that catalysts can increase the rate of chemical reaction by reducing the activation energy. However, catalyst does not affect equilibrium constants. Two, when you are writing equilibrium constants, solids do not appear. Solids do not appear in equilibrium constants. Why? The concentration of solids is taken to be one. So they don't even appear in equilibrium constants because their concentration will always be taken as unity. All that being said, let's look at this equation. Given this equation, L2 plus 3H2 to give us 2NH3. The equilibrium constant K, E, Q will simply be equals. We start from the product. Concentration of the product raised to the power of the number of moles of the product. So we have just one product, ammonia gas. We simply say concentration of ammonia NH3 raised to the power of the number of moles 2 raised to the power of 2 over then nitrogen is in gaseous state it will appear so N2 the number of moles is 1 so raised to the power of 1 or you just leave it like that we have a second reactant hydrogen in gaseous state what do we do? H2 now, what is the number of moles of hydrogen? That is 3. Raised to the power of 3. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've written equilibrium constant. 
That is it. Now let's see the second one here. K E Q will simply be we have limestone uh, breaking down to give us calcium oxide and carbon four oxide. We we'll start with the products. Calcium oxide is in solid state. Take note of the state. CaCO3 is a solid state, calcium oxide is a solid state, and CO2 is a gaseous state. Solids do not appear in equilibrium constant. Their concentration is taken to be 1. So, since this guy is a solid, we ignore it. Carbon dioxide is gas. So, we bring out CO2 concentration. And what is the power? It is 1 mole raised to the power of 1. So, let's leave that over the reactant, concentration of the reactant. We have a single reactant, and the state of that reactant is solid state. Since this guy is solid, no, it will not appear. So, the equilibrium constant for limestone decomposing to give us calcium oxide and carbon four oxide is concentration of CO2. So, if you are given the concentration of CO2, it will simply be your answer for the equilibrium constant. And for this, they are all in gaseous state, they will appear. This will simply be concentration of SO2 raised to the power of 2 times concentration of O2 all over concentration of SO3 raised to the power of 2. This will be, for the product, they are all gases. Concentration of NO2 raised to the power of 4, KEQ is equals NO2, concentration of NO2 raised to the power of 4 times O2, concentration of O2 raised to the power of 1. Since it is 1, we ignore. The reactant is N2O5 gas. N2O5 gas. And the number of mole is 2 raised to the power of 2. So there is no magic. Basically, any question you get under equilibrium constant is this way. They are usually very, very easy. And here is the relationship between Kc and Kp. Kc is equilibrium constant in terms of concentration, Why Kp is equilibrium constant in terms of partial pressure, which is for gases. So generally, partial pressure is proportional or equivalent to concentration. The relationship between Kc and Kp is that Kp is equals Kc, then in bracket, ROT raised to the power of changing NG. This is an OBG question. You see, which of the following is the relationship between Kc and Kp. So this is the right formula. Change in NG is number of moles of the product minus number of moles of the reactant. You look at the product, you add the number of moles. Like in this case, we have, okay, let's say in this case, the number of moles of the product is 2. Here, number of moles of reactant, 1 plus 3, that is 4. So change the energy will be 2 minus 4. For this case, number of moles of product is 4 plus 1, 5. For the reactant, 2. 5 minus 2, 3. So change the energy will be 3. T is absolute temperature, and R is the molar gas constant. With that, life gets so easy for you. There is only one more thing left to discuss under chemical equilibrium, and that is Le Chatella's principle. I've decided to dedicate a whole episode for it. So, in episode number 38, that is the next episode, we will look at Le Chatella's principle and how it changes the price of Gary in the market. For now, install the Flash Learner Jam application and begin to play with questions. It is going to help you pass Jam. In fact, with only the app, you are going to pass very, very well. It doesn't require internet, it is offline. So use the YouTube description, visit flashlearner.com or search your Play Store Flash Learner Jam. You will see the name, you will see the logo, and when you install it, you will see the name on your phone. That is to show that you installed the app. So for inquiries, for guide, for talk, you have personal issue you wish to discuss with me, for mentorship, let me know, reach me on any of my social handles. I am here to guide you. I am here to make you better. See ya.